Look, when someone watches a movie, it's always in their best interest to ruin their day with something savage and dehumanizing that just reeks with hopelessness, brutality, and depression, right? Am I right? Well, that must have been what I was thinking because me and my friend, we let ourselves into a theater of sorrow, not expecting 12 years to be one of those movies that just punches you square in the fucking chest, man. And if that sounds joyous enough, try topping that off with an even bleaker movie, one that touches upon the horrors of Japanese occupation and Nanjing. I mean, you know what? Why not just give me a noose that comes with a razor blade and a pistol with a hollow point just to make sure it blows the back of my goddamn head out, just to make sure it does the job right? Alright, so aside from Steve McQueen's desire to instill suicidal tendencies in the people who watched 12 Years a Slave, I'm going to say right now that 12 Years a Slave is definitely one of the highlights of 2013. I mean, it's even the second runner-up to my favorite film of 13, Gravity. Why is that movie number one? One, it's badass. Two, it's badass. What do you want? Regardless of that, I'm moving on. What we have here is an ugly piece of reality. A really ugly piece. A, an ugly truth that people would rather not explore. Something that people would rather keep underground. I mean... Requiem for a Dream owns that title for drugs, but I'd say 12 Years a Slave takes that title for slavery. Although, I'm certain people are going to start arguing on behalf of Roots, but I'm not getting into that. Anyway, moving on to 12 Years a Slave. Based on a novel, which is based on a true story, 12 Years a Slave centers around Solomon Northup, a free family man filled to the brim with intellect, sophistication, and skills. Skills in playing the violin, to be more specific. So. One day, he's introduced to two men who claim to be part of a circus tour, and they ask if Solomon can accompany them and provide their tour with music. Yeah, he agrees, but unexpectedly, he's abducted and sold into slavery, stripped of everything he once had, man. I'm talking a home, a family, a name, and respect as a human being. I mean, during this horrific time as a slave, he encounters many, many masters, portrayed by the infamously sweaty Paul Dano, Benedict Cumberbatch, and Michael Fassbender, just to name a few. Here's a question. What is it about this movie that hurts? Seeing a man superior with knowledge and skills be stripped of his very existence and downgraded into nothing more than a false sense of property, and slowly fade into a hopeless individual bound to endure physical and psychological torture? Or seeing an environment that permits an entire race of people to live no better than pigs living in a pen? Or the fact that no one, and I mean no one, can intervene when someone is bound to face an extreme and inexplicable punishment, and I say punishment in quotations. Well, let's see. All three of them take the cake. Not to say that depiction of slavery ever fails to pack a punch, but the fact that McQueen can put in the effort to slowly trot us along this grisly world and bring the ignored tortures and horrors of slavery on the surface just kills anyone inside, man. And I'm sure that's what he wanted, so I commend him. I say bravo for making that happen. But to top off all that torture, it's carried along by a fucking majestic performance by Chiwetel Ejiofor, man. And not just in a sense of line delivery or verbal communication, but also in a sense of pantomiming. I mean, looking into this guy's face throughout the movie was like looking directly into fear itself. I mean, it's one thing to convey fear through dialogue, but if you can have it expressed on your face alone and I can feel it tenfold, I'd say that's brilliant, man. But why am I surprised? I mean, Ed Geoffrey himself is a damn fine actor. An actor who I forget most of the time is British, to be honest. But, uh, oh well. But uh, another thing I'm going to mention is the irony of his character. Given the fact that his intelligence and skills in navigation, carpentry, and what have you, his knowledge and Pretty much everything outdoes practically every single master he encounters on all of the uh, on all the plantations, but he's silenced. I mean, it's 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 almost funny how it seems to be that he can intimidate his foes with his wit, so they shut him down. You know, it's it's like they can't even deal with the fact that these people who they view as animals are humans with intellect. You know what I mean? So, you know, it's funny, but at the same time, it's sad. But moving on. Second behind Edgy Ofer is Fastbender, who played Master Reps, and let me tell you guys something. This guy made me sick, man. I mean, just the thought of this guy made my stomach churn and eat itself. I mean, it's one thing to portray an evil master of a plantation, but to make me hate you with every single fiber of my well-being, that is a job well done in my eyes. 
Fast Bender's performance is a powerful one, let me tell you. Actually, you know what? Remember how none of us could believe that Leo was snubbed from a nomination for Django? Well, if the same happens for Edgy Ofer or Fastbender, or even at least one of them, I'd say it's time to call the Academy out on the crap, man. I mean, their, their track record for, uh, for snubs is starting to grow way out of control. But let's not get too far into that just yet. Let's hold our breath. We'll see what happens. Moving on. So, if you can't get enough of your brutal and torturous slave epics, then they're gonna love this one even more because the camera work is terrific, very good. Not just in a sense of lighting and angles, but there were many moments in this film where the camera is the only person speaking. I mean, there are long shots that visually express fear, desperation, death, the yearn for human contact, and just all around horror of being a slave on the plantations at the time. Beautiful work done on Sean Bobbitt's part, and hopefully this guy doesn't go by ignored either. And what I really like about the film is that the fact, the fact that the entire situation is bleak, a very bleak one, yet it's very colorful. You know, they didn't cop out by giving the movie a gray and colorless look. I mean, it makes sense given the context of the film, but the fact that they can make color work with such horror, excellence. But that's me. Moving on. Hey, what do you know? I have another question. Are you a fan of minimalism? Well great, 12 Years of Slave is for you then. I mean, instead of knocking you over the head in a cheesy, over the top fashion with diegetic music, the score is very, very quiet and used when appropriate. So hooray for the use of silence that builds an atmosphere in a non-diegetic fashion most of the time. Something that's almost akin to No Country for Old Men and its lack of stylization in music. I mean, the natural flow and presentation is what makes the movie. I mean, nothing flashy, nothing, no stylization at all. And aside from stylization, people like to say brutality adds nothing onto horror. Well, I call bullcrap, because the disgusting amounts of violence and whippings presented in 12 Years a Slave just enhance the overall grisly nature of it. And I'm not going to go into spoiler territory, but there's one particular scene, one particular part that's very tough to watch. Given the fact that it's done in one complete take, and we can clearly see what's happening every now and then, you know, for a few seconds here and there, the cries the extremity and the painful sounds of it all, man, it just, it makes it incredibly tough to digest. And when we're presented with the aftermath, man, it's really, really heartbreaking, to say the least. I mean, 12 Years a Slave is brutally honest in its depiction, and not to mention the fact that it's carried by stellar performances from both Fassbender and Angie Ofer. Hell, even the extras, man, they did a great job. Plus, 12 Years a Slave is definitely a film that only enhances the quality of McQueen's filmography. So, if you haven't seen it yet and you're up for something that doesn't shy away from historical cruelty, catch it before it leaves theaters. Alright, so next up, The City of Life and Death, or Nanjing, Nanjing. It covers the Japanese occupation of China's former capital, Nanjing. Am I, am I, am I saying that right? Well, it, it, it centers around refugees who hid in the international security zone from the Japanese, only for the Japanese to pretty much be like, yo, who gives a fuck about a security zone? That's not going to stop us. And no, 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 it didn't stop them. One thing I will say about this in comparison to 12 Years a Slave is that the transition into horror happens at a much slower pace. I mean, it takes a bit of time before things get really nasty in comparison to the former, of course. But once it takes off, man, it fucking hits, dude. Let me tell you, it really hits. All right, so here's what's going down in Najing's occupation. Without covering too much and just getting directly into the film, the movie follows Tong. A man working under a Nazi party member to keep the zone under control, uh, you know, pretty much his secretary, along with keeping his wife, daughter, and sister-in-law safe. The second character is a woman named Jiang, who also helps run the security zone, but I'm not too sure what on what her uh, position is. The third character is a Japanese soldier named Kadokawa, whose role in the film can be seen as something like a coming-of-age type of experience because his ignorance of what's going on around him begins to fade away and he starts to see the bi the the, uh, the bigger picture of what's really happening and you know what changes his his character arc and whatnot so that's th those are the other characters right there but another thing i gotta mention is the fact that talking about this movie is going to be pretty difficult because while i can summarize most of everything by saying many refugees are raped and murdered many of the japanese soldiers are sick pricks and it's a hopeless movie yada yada adjective here adjective there summarizations don't really do any justice explaining how grisly this movie is. I mean, I could go into detail, but a lot of key points would go into spoiler territory, so I need to hold back on a lot of information, so 
of course, I may end up sounding like a broken record in comparison to uh, what I said about 12 years, but just bear with me here, people. Anyway, people, being captured by the Japanese during this occupation was literally nothing more than a gateway to rape, torture, and murder. I mean, women were forced to shave their heads completely and dress like men in order to, uh, to avoid being raped by Japanese soldiers, and half the time that didn't even work. And many women were sent to the prostitution in exchange for food and water and clothing, and that would give the Chinese a false sense of survival and hope, especially for their children, you know, so they can survive through the winter. But, you know, just ultimately, it just didn't mean shit in the end because the Japanese, they were insane. Not to mention that many people were sent away for uh, what I'd like to call target practice. I mean, these were dreadful times. But what really hits hard about this movie is the fact that the Chinese had at least put up a fight against the Japanese, you know what I mean? And I mean a damn good fight, but nevertheless, they were outnumbered, you know? But the beauty of a nation that would keep their pride and say that they would never go down or burn in vain, no matter how powerful the opposing enemy is, is something powerful and endearing. But that power is soon stripped away by the, uh, by the Japanese. and. What we have left are innocents running and hiding for what little survival there is. I mean, even afraid to look in the direction of a Japanese soldier. I mean, fear basically swallows the entire blood-soaked capital, people. Fear of the unpredictable nature of the Japanese soldiers. Fear of the slaughter and raping of children and women. Fear of just living. Death would be a blessing rather than living and nonging at that time, if I may say so myself. And to top it all off, the failure to hold back the Japanese invasion Man, I mean, it was inevitable, but just that feeling, you know, that feeling of if we couldn't defeat them, then who will? What will? What's left for us to fight for now? You know, this is, a, it's a very hopeless movie. And aside from hopelessness, the movie is appropriately filmed in black and white. I mean, yeah, the idea of filming something cruel in black and white may seem somewhat cliche a little bit now, but it really is effective here, and naturally it just works. I mean, think about it. How much color do you think the movie would have been had it been shot in color? Not much. I'm sure it would have been just as bleak and lifeless as it is now, but anyway. Much like 12 Years a Slave, it's a very natural movie that doesn't aim to show the inspirational uprise of an oppressed nation or oppressed people in a diegetic fashion. The atrocities that were never explored in vivid details are right here, presented right in front of us. You know, they give us a true sense of what citizens in the 30s in Nanjing experienced and what the slaves in the 1800s had experienced as well, man. I mean, these are two hard-hitting movies. So, one more thing I want to touch upon with Nanjing. I want to talk about the Japanese character Karokawa. Like I said before, his role in the film was very similar to what you can call a coming-of-age kind of experience. I mean, there are many things about his character that are very childlike. Like, for example, and this is giving away minor things about the film, but whatever, here we go. Japanese women were also stationed in China, Nanjing, as, uh, as comfort girls. So, when Karokawa went to go meet with a comfort girl, he met a prostitute named Yuriko. And it's revealed in that scene that Karokawa had no prior sexual experience and she had been his first time. And to be honest, the thought of losing your virginity in a time like that, it's kind of sad. I mean, think about it. Experiencing natural human contact that way for the first time during a time of inhumane treatment and hysteria, I mean, that's just... That's unbearable, man. I mean, even Yuriko herself even broke down into tears. I mean, who would have thought that there still would have been some innocence left in any of these men who were sent to slaughter civilians? Well, in at least one of the men. And as Karokawa's eyes broadened to see his fellow, to see what his fellow men are truly doing to these people, I mean, the psychological effects, people, they're, they're very detrimental to his well-being. And that's all I'll say. I mean, it's nothing on the level of Colonel Kurtz, but... You'll see what I mean. Alright, so like I said before, or tried to say before, reiterating is a bit pointless because I had already just went on about 12 Years a Slave, and talking about these two movies, it's kind of pointless since they both have the same thing going on for them. So let me switch it up a bit. Which film was more devastating to you? Now hear me out, this isn't a competition of occupation versus slavery, which was worse, yada yada. This is a personal question. Which did you personally find more devastating? Now, let me look into both from my own perspective. Now, 
I'm African American male, so the ties with 12 Years a Slave are obviously closer, especially given the fact that we see the movie through the perspective of a man with a steady life that many could could just possibly dream of and with the sophistication that could lead into bigger and better things, you know? I mean, he's the positive representation of an entire race, showing what we're capable of. But the heartbreaking reality being that white Americans back then had viewed African Americans, free or not, as animals with no human qualities and if we showcased any, we'd be left to face harsh repercussions, practically forcing us to live like animals the alleged superiors had envisioned. It's heartbreaking, it really is, so for me, it knocks all the wind out of my chest. It's really effective. Alright, so moving on to Nanjing. While this movie may not affect me as much as it does others, the intentional slaughter of people is a fear that is not exclusive to one race, nor is it exclusive to one demographic. Women, men, and children shot down and slaughtered without even a moment's thought, man. That's horrifying. And while both tragedies in, the, in, uh, in 12 Years a Slave and Nanjing are awful and by no means call for any justification at all, the, the brutality of, of uh, Nanjing slightly surpasses that of 12 years. For because for almost every second of Nanjing, I never ever felt a moment where the tension and fear had been subsided. Even when things had calmed down for a moment, just for at least for one simple moment, there was always that feeling, that, that, that sense of impending doom that the Japanese could just show up at any second and, and fuck it all up or just decide to ruin the, a calm and mellow moment for the sake of their own sick amusement and joy. So I'll answer my own question like this. Both were devastating films, but Nanjing called for more moments where the tears would build up in my eyes. But either way, both of these films are brutally honest, horrific in their depictions, and call for stomachs that can digest graphic violence, psychological, and physical torture. And there we go. Alas, people. Finally done. Finally got those two films off of my chest. And my god, what a mouthful. But whatever. On to a happier note, people, tis the season for Christmas. Christmas galore with bumbling idiots we all love, families who can never get their crap together and have a perfect day of Christmas, along with heroes who fight for the eggnog, the presents, and their wives, of course. So stay tuned, people. Santa's on his way.